Hello everyone, this is um, John Cann at State Archives and I'm bringing you the webinar today on Railway Records. It's going to be an interesting journey for us all, including myself, because Railway Records are some of the most fascinating records we have in the collection and we have inherited the, the wonderful archives of State Rail and with it a wide variety of things. So you're going to learn a lot today and I hope parts of it will be of particular interest in your research. Now to start, we received all the um, archives of the State Rail in, in one big go and in a sense we adopted their um, systems of organising the records. So for those of you who've been done research in the past, you'll be aware we have R series records. They're actually the, the numbering system of the State Rail archives. So they are, as you can see on the transferring document there, State Rail Authority of New South Wales, series title, contracts, bonds and agreements. Now what you, that's the system that we adopted from them but over a significant amount of time, we've been working on it and transferring them into our systems, which we are, you perhaps be more aware of, and they're available through collection search on the right hand side on our main web page. So those will eventually all be transferred into what we call NRSs, New South Wales Record Series, and at, as of the current time, I believe we've transferred 75% of the collection, so it's significantly underway. When I first worked here, that was significantly lower. Now we'll take a look at the right hand side, and this is our website as it is of, of a few days ago. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to get started with your research into rail. And the first the group of the audience I want to show you how to do things is going to be the historians who like their rail history. So we'll have a look. I'm, an ex I'm a historian, so I'd like to begin at the beginning, and let's do that now. If you look down the bottom, you can see advanced search. That's the right place to go for any search where you're looking for something specific. I go in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the content type. So I'm thinking like an archivist now and I want to show you how to do it. So of the options, you can see many options. The one that's most useful to me and for us is agency search. That means I can search for a specific agency of government, which will be rail in our case. As you can see, I've now got agency selected in the content type. I'm moving down to the title, which is railway for this research that we're doing, and I hit enter. Now th what this has done is it's created a series of results which are all based upon what I'm interested in, which is railway history. And you can see there's a wide variety of things there. Now, for the sake of the webinar, I can't take you through all of these examples, but you can do this yourself at home, and you can see enormous number of interesting series through the collection all the way down. So now what I'm going to do for today's webinar is show you just one, and it's one that I think isn't generally noticed in our collection, it's the Sydney Railway Company. It began as a private company, was eventually um, amalgamated into government archives, and so let's have a look, let's go there. Now what you can see is that on our agency description will be a very detailed research on that specific agency. Um, you can see on the right hand side we've got preceding agencies, so if you want to look at the older version of this particular agency you can. If you want to look at the one that a little bit later on in time, it moved into the commissioners of Sydney and Hunter Rover Railways, you can go forward in time as well. So archival research is a little bit like forwards backwards in finding the right time frame for what you want to look into. Now for the sake of today's webinar, I'm going to show you just this particular company I was formed in 1849. Now we have a long administrative history. I like emphasising these on most of my webinars because I think it is extremely well researched and for someone who's got an interest in context, it gives you wonderful context. Now in this case, I can't go through the whole document, it's too big. Let's just have a look at some bullet points. It talks about the first meeting of interested parties when the, when the company was formed. It talks about raising a prospectus and a little bit later on. Cutting to the chase, we go to the transfer of ownership to the state government. So in a sense, if you were to spend more time on that particular bit of writing, you can get a really good history of the Sydney Rail Company and it comes with footnotes down the bottom. So if you want to take it up further. So we go back to the agency screen because we're now we're going to look at the, the records, which is what, we're, what this webinar is all about. So I go down to the bottom of that page and I can see a listing of all the records we have for that agency. We're now doing research. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on this view here which is going to optimise the view for what I want to do and that is I want to make it so it's double sided. I find that useful for my own research because I can browse things very quickly, it reduces the number of pages I've got to page through and I can usually by looking at the years on the different series I can work out which ones are interesting for what I want to do today. Now for this, for today, 
I'm interested in something about the Sydney Railway Company that's unique. So I'm looking down and I'm browsing and I come across this one, the minutes of the meetings of the directors, Sydney of the Railway Company. Sounds perfect for today's webinar, so let's go there. We go in, we can see a series description, just like the agency description. It gives incredible detail, as you can see. And we're now going to go out into the archive and have a look at one of the records in that series. So naturally, I got the first book, and this is it. I wanted you to see something from the archives, and this is it. The first volume one, if you look on the left-hand side, minute book, volume one. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the date, Sydney, 11th of September, 1848. So it's the original meeting of the first board. We draw it forward and these names all bear investigation. They're all luminaries in, inside the railways and the growth of railways in the colony. Um, Charles Kemp went on to be a commissioner of railways. Ralph Mansfield and also Charles Kemp were involved in the Sydney Morning Herald and there are many other stories there. William Lithgow is the man that they named uh, Lithgow after at a later time. So they're all important figures in the history of railways and of the colony. Let's go to the second page. I want, I want you to see what is possible when you do research. And on the second page, I'll draw it forward. We can see some interesting information for our research. Establishment of a railway company be called the Australian Southern and Western Railway Company. So here it is, that's it, the birth of New South Wales Rail. A little further down, we're going to enter into communication with the colonial government to ascertain what countenance and support will be extended from the public resources. And to translate, they wanted money from the government to run the private company. Uh, in another part of our collection, in Colonial Secretary's letters, we see a map of the original planning for Central Station. Now this is in 1849 as well, and it's, it's um, from a letter in 1849. And you can see on this map, um, it's actually approximately the area of Central Station today. But what's interesting is that before it became Central Station, it has a lot of interest. First of all, the original railway station occupied only a small corner of the current grounds at the top left. You have the burial grounds dominating the area that is now the station. You've got areas marked on this map. We're going to be using this yellow for um, going to remain crown land, but the green is for future use of the railway. I think if you go to modern maps, you'll realise that whole area is now is now the central station. We've got the Benevolent Asylum, which comes up in our records and in your research at times. Carter's Barracks. And so you can see right there the origins of railways at Central Station in Colonial Secretary's letters. Now this is an interesting series I found also in the agency descriptions and it's the data transfer of the Sydney Railways Company to the Commissioners of Railways. Now we're going to stop the story of the first railway company here, but it's interesting because it's history. And here we go, we've got the first data transfer of the private company, Sydney Railways Company, into government hands and then went to the Commissioners of Railways and from that point forward you will find them completely in our archives as well, under Commissioner of Railways originally. And always the deeds look very interesting. We're going to zoom in on the signings because you can see the top one is the seal of the Sydney Railway Company and the bottom one is the seal of the Commissioners of Railways. You'll notice by the way there, right there, Giles Kemp, he was actually a member of the, of the company and eventually became one of the Commissioners, so he must have made a transfer around that time. And that is actually just a little bit of eye candy for you. Um, you can see the first um, train that was actually used by the Sydney Railway Company and it was a different idea to the current railway technology. That's at the Powerhouse Museum. So we'll go back and now we'll do a different sort of search. Um, I'm going to extend our idea of the Sydney Railway Company in the beginning and around the central station. And we're just going to have a general search in it, like we're browsing the collection. So when you put in Central Station, notice on the left hand side I've got record series and items. You can see all sorts of views, um, glass negatives, building construction and maintenance files, signal diagram drawings and so forth. For someone who wants to do research using key terms such as Central Station draws forward lots of options that you can, you can access here at Kingswood. Now I've flicked on the left hand side under filter results to photos and images. 
Now, something that we have a lot of in, when, in terms of railway records is photographs. And I, I cannot do the subject justice in today's webinar, but if I pique your interest, feel free to go on the website and make searches around any terms you like with the word railway and you will find an enormous number of fascinating photographs. I noticed one there which I didn't highlight, the German railway gun at Central Station after World War I. But let's have a look. I'm, I just thought I'd focus in on Central Station and show you what we have on one subject. In 1871, we have this photograph, which is the original station on the corner of the property that it now dominates Central Station. I'm just going to breeze through this. This is like a photo essay for you. In 1879, that's what the station looked like. This is the old, what I would call the old railway station. And inside the station as well, in 1880. And this is the transition into now the new central station when they're actually surveying through the burial areas for the railway station that we all take very, we now all now utilize in travel. And this is the diagram. As you can see, it's very similar to what you and I can relate to. And then we transition into the station as we see it today. And you can see there are very similarities in the in the horizon of today and of 1906. I believe that gazebo is still there. Here's another photo from 1906. Now, when I see panoramic views in the collection, I really love to show them in webinars and talks because they are very beautiful and they do really give you a sense of time and place. And if you look carefully at the details down there in, on the roads, you can see horse and buggies in 1906. This is on the other side of the station, Broadway. Again, look at the horse and buggies in 1915. I see a tram, but I haven't seen any cars in that image. We'll go inside for 1920. This is one of the areas that I usually buy my newspaper when I'm walking through the station on the way to the country, in the country areas. And you can see that it's been a place where you can have, um, buy a drink, um, on your way through the station, but this this particular thing is long gone now. Another one from inside from 1948. In one of the areas, you can see that it's, it's still an area for eating food, but it, it hasn't changed dramatically from this time. And we're beginning to wind down the photo section. In 1958, this is an image from Central Station. Except for the way people dress, you can relate to it in terms of it looks very similar to today, but and yet it's also very different. And to show you that our archives is continually progressing and moving forward, I'm going to show you an image from 1981. And except for the colours, it is still it looks very similar to that today. Which brings me to the next section, and now I'm targeting a different style of record. For the person, for the people who would like to do research into the buildings of the railways, it is one of the most significant engineering feats of New South Wales history. And when you take into account that it goes all over the state and has significant impact on societies everywhere, we have a lot of interest in plans and drawings. And they've come to, through to us in our 560s, which shows you that it's such a large collection, we haven't, class of, we haven't um, um, we haven't made a control system for it in our NRS system, but we still use the old railway R560. So as we go in, the R560s are all actually on microfilm plastic. So they're sheets of plastic and you can see um, all different sorts of diagrams and plans. Now they're actually archives because that's how they came to us from the from the state rail. So this is the, the records that they were keeping of the building of their own railroads. And, and of course, there's a wide variety of subjects. Locomotives, as you can see here. So we have steam locomotives, diesel and electric rolling stock, carriages and wagons, and lots of different types. You can see there on that image in front of you that we have they have the, the, the precision and the engineering is truly a marvel. I find them personally some of the most beautiful things in our collection. And uh, I'm in awe of the skill of the, of the engineers. But of course, and if you look closer, we can actually, they're so good, you can actually design your own um, trains from them. And there are people, enthusiasts who come into the collection, look at these diagrams and then build working replicas. They're that good and they're that thorough. This is inside a boiler. You still need to have boilers inspected for safety reasons. Oh, 
a, lot, a part, large part of today's webinar is going to be show and tell. I'm just, I'm, I think the beauty is in what you can see. And also, the, I find it awe-inspiring. We're now to go to a different style of record that are also in map plans and drawings, and that is seamling working plan sections and proclaimed and contract drawings. Now, these are going to, generally speaking, be of communities and, and stations and track that's being laid. And so just, just a sample only, so you can see that they exist and we have them. Um, we've got this one of North Richmond, and you can see where the station's going to fall and also the track as it's being laid. And if you combine it with some research into land ownership on the Historical Land Records Viewer for Registry of Lands, Land Registry Services, you can probably attach plots of land to people who own them as well. So this is a little bit of a, a, a part of the tapestry of a history of local communities can be seen inside some of these sorts of records. I just use this as an example. It's got a, it's got an, a, a little diagram of how they're going to lay the track. And there's a lot of different sorts of how to builds. I found um, plans of bridges and all sorts of things. Now we also have in this series station, depot and signal diagrams. Uh, we have images of trains and ferries as well. Trams and ferries, excuse me. Now this is an example of what we have quite a lot of, which is actual diagrams of station, passenger stations. And although there's, a, there's been a modernization of the railway system in recent times, a lot of these sorts of buildings still stand and still are in use in different places. I pause on this one because it is so complex, there's so much to look at. And of course, for those of you who would like to make a model, you can. I once had a call, one of the most interesting inquiries I ever had in the archive was from a, a man who wanted to give his um, wife a 50th anniversary of their, of their engagement because he proposed on the station. Um, he wanted to have a diagram of the station because he wanted to make a small diorama for us. So that one brings very happy memories back to me because I'm sure he got what he wanted and we also able to supply him with photographs. Here's your station, a closer look. And that goes down to diagram level. So you know, in this sense, it's the, it's the actual diagram of their rail and how it's laid and so forth on your station. And this is a boiler that's at the station. I imagine it might have um, powered up the steam um, locomotives. So we'll stop there because the nature of today's webinar is to show you, to give you a, a, a way into a different styles of records. Now, in addition to those aperture cards, we also have a, a large series of maps and plans for state archives at State Archives for Railways. And but the thing that I have to begin before I show you things is that these are actually very problematic records, um, not impossible to access at all. Um, they just, in a sense, you have to go through the process. Now, what you see on the left is how the vast majority are stored. Um, they've been stored in, in rolled format, which creates conservation problems, because every time you unroll a rolled plan, you, you, you know, it presents issues in terms of how to keep the record intact and safe. So what they do is they go through a process of being appraised, and the conservators will need to look at it. Now, that means that you, when you do want to look at rolled plans, you will have to ask for um, access with a few days notice, one week's notice. Then you have five days, and that will, in that time, conservation will look at them and then determine if it needs treatment or if anything, if there are any issues in terms of them being looked at in the reading room. Um, the whole nature of the archives is we make records available to the public, and today's webinar is one part of doing that. But we also have a huge responsibility to look after the archives of the state and to leave it in good condition for the next generation. So this is, in our sense, our way of doing that. Now, if a current plan cannot be issued due to its current condition, you can request conservation treatment, but that's when things slow down because of the nature of the work. It's very, very time consuming. It can take six months. In my experience, it's, it's generally speaking not been an issue, but I can't guarantee every case. So when you do go into these sorts of plans, it can be a process, but it's a process where I'm now going to show you some of the rewards. And they are some of the most beautiful things in the collection. This is the extension of Parramatta to Penrith, which would have been after the Sydney Railway Company era, in those years after, and you can see it's the Great Western Railway at this time. 
it's it's a little faded, but it's an original record, and these are starting to be made available on the website as well. And we also have them in rolled plans for the reading room, so far more than what's currently available on the website. You can see that's probably a, a picture of Penrith. We'll go to another one, just a different style of record. This is in R301, which is one of the main roll plan series. And it is a viaduct over Long Cove Creek at Petersham. We have the workshops at Everly, also in R301. Uh, and I apologize for moving on. I thought I was scrolling on that image, but it's just a plan of the workshops. And I, I'm uh, intentionally with today's webinar, I'm actually trying to show you a series of snapshots because the collection is so huge. I could spend days um, giving you a really uh, ambitious display of everything we have. But what I hope I'm doing with today's webinar is just giving you a taste because then it, you move into the research phase. And here's one of the rewards of research. Some of our, our diagrams and different series, but certainly with railways, are, are truly beautiful. This happens to be the sand furnace at Honeysuckle Point, Newcastle. And only a sample. We have many more like this. We have a plan here of the, the railway Parramatta Liverpool. And you can see that it's been, uh, an effort's been made to put down the land as they move through the different areas, gauges and so forth. Here's a station master's house at Mount Victoria. And one of my personal favorites is locomotives because it, the precision is, in my, my view, awe inspiring. Truly a modern marvel. So now we move to one of the f series that uh, as is generally speaking not used because people aren't aware that it's available. It is available in our co in collection search now, so I imagine that many people will occasionally start finding it. And it's the historical notes and references. Now these were actually created by the um, State Rail. They were, I, from what I can tell, they were written in the 1960s, so they can have a tendency to be a little bit old fashioned and even possibly a little bit out of date. But what it does do, it does give you a, a sense of railway history. For example, the history of different stations and so forth, where the names came from, that kind of thing. And so it is well worth a look. The series is NRS 16401. So if you go advanced search in, in a, and do an, a series search and put that number in, you can pull it up very quickly. And it does actually take you through to different sorts of records. And, and what you will find in there is sketches, diagrams, maps and photographs, trial surveys, survey reports, letters and petitions, ends of land through which the railway had to pass and building specifications. So for those of you who want to go into the history of the different sorts of railways, this is actually one of your options. It also provides curves and gradients, track descriptions, layout opening dates, contracts, electrification, load tables, histories of lines and stations, deviations, parliamentary reports. So, so you can see, in a sense, it's the history already written provided you take into account that it does seem to have been created in the 1960s, so therefore it doesn't continue on. And this is just one sample. A few, I'm giving you a few samples here just to give you a sense of what's in the series. A little diagram here. This happens to be in the area of Picton, part of original track between points A and B are abandoned, and so forth. You can find out all sorts of information here that has been created for historical reasons in the past. There's Mittagong. And now the next section, we're gonna talk about career records. Now, I, I did the webinar myself on employees, uh, government of, on, on occupations, and so I did mention in there um, that you can access personal history cards, and I will mention it again today for the sake of today's audience. But I'll go a little bit further today because it's on the subject of railway records. Now the main series is the personal history cards for employees born before 1900. And we've had a continuation by receiving the series also after 1900, if you're born after 1900. So you can access history cards for all employees in that era. And anything in the last 30 years, we refer to um, the railway. 
Now, when we dive in, this is just an example of our next Prime Minister, Ben Chifley, and it is and it, what you can see in a typical railway card is going to be a, a series of the different positions the person held in the railways. And what you get also is their location, what branch they're in, and what their job was, and what their pay was. And this is a lot of information. From this, you can draw out a real personal history of the person. Now, in Chifley's case, it is actually interesting because if you can look there, you can see in 1917, he was dismissed by proclamation, left work on strike in defence of, of the ex-Prime Minister. Uh, of, of some, a huge percentage of the workforce went on strike. It was a major issue at the time. And only the best were re-employed, which, of which Ben Chifley was one. You can see after his, that period, he was a driver, then a fireman, then a driver, then a fireman, then a driver, then a fireman. And the only theory I've had, I've heard myself on why the jobs kept being switched is perhaps it was to share the pay between two people. I'll leave that for you to be the judge of that. On the right hand side, on the right hand side you can see a series of, of notes that were taken and they are all related to his political career and essentially taking leave for elections. And it turns out he did not too bad at that. Like most research, you can see he resigns finally in 1928. And for further information on Ben Chifley, please refer to Wikipedia or to any book that you can find in the State Library or elsewhere. But what um, what we can see is that when you look and go in research in archives, you can see hooks that will lead you to research in other places. In this case, I would take it up with anything that records the, his political career. And you can then get the history of the whole person. And that's how history really gets interesting. Now, we have other sorts of um, personal history cards. They're not generally speaking in use because the, people are not aware that they, they exist, I think. So for today's webinar, I'm just drawing your attention to all these other series. You can see most of them have been transferred into our uh, NRS series, which means they're findable inside collection search. But to access records in those series, you would have to come to Kingswood and you would have to then go to the counter and talk about the series and say, look, I think this manager junior record might reflect my person and how do I go forward? And it's actually quite a simple process. We'll look through item listings and we'll find the right box and go and get the record for you. So this is, a this is if it applies to your particular situation of what you know happened with your ancestor, it is a very rich source of information. And we occasionally still get um, estrays in the railways where different sections held their own cards for a period and for some reason they weren't transferred into archives. So this is something that is quite a rich source of information in your history if you're looking for an individual. And one of the interesting things about railway history cards in general, looking at it from a society point of view, is the railways were, were and also are employees all across the state. So in railway personal history cards, you really do get a sense of the whole state, of the whole communities in all the different parts and every corner of the state. And it's a real part of the fabric of who we are and what we are. And we, all of it is researchable here at State Archives. I'm just moving down the page. Um, I'll, I'll start to peter out from this line of talking. But you can see we've even got personal files of staff engaged in military service in 1939. That's during the World War II period. Time and pay sheets of railway employees. So a lot of archives in the end are a little bit fragmentary because there's not, there's not necessarily one record that fits all. Uh, our main series of state, uh, of the, for example, the Ben Chifley card, personal history cards, is so strong, I just, just want to bring to your attention today that we've got other options as well. Now, if you go into research A to Z, um, what you can see for any subject is you can go down and look at a specific subject. So today, of course, we're going to railways and railway workers. So I wanted to bring forward to your attention that you can do this at home as well. And also, if today's webinar has inspired you, you can actually go straight on to Records A to Z and do what I'm doing now. So I go in and I hit guides. Now you've got indexes and we've got guides. In this case, I'm going guides. And what you can see on the right hand side is a whole series of different subjects guides relating to railways. Refreshment rooms, we have record, a lot of records relating to refreshment rooms. We have records of employees, I've just talked about that. And for all the other records, you'd go to the top guide. And that's going to be a really good way for you to take this webinar and go one or two steps further before you begin your actual research. Now, if we click on the indexes, naturally enough, this is the strongest way to do family history because you can search indexes by name and there's a variety of indexes on the page. 
going all the way back to some of the earlier records just after the railway company period. I'm specifically thinking about that one there, Railway Employer Records, 1856 to 1917. I was part of the indexing of that record series myself. So let's go into one of the indexes and put Thomas Bogue, Railway Employment Records. And you can see from that early period, we've got a reference to a person and it gives you all the information you need. Either you can click on the left hand side in that box and order a photocopy or you can come into the reading room and look at the original. Now, the, this is a copy from microfilm, but it is, and it is a little messy, but I'm, I'm showing you how it is. And this is, this is research when it, at its rawest, where you actually look at original items and see how they are. And you can see there's a little bit of scribbling out and changing of things because as time passes, people's careers change, their pay goes up, their pay goes down, they might get reprimanded or they might get promoted. So you've got all the different things happening and you can see it in these history, is these records. I can see correspondence there as well. Now I haven't personally researched that correspondence, but I would look under railways um, in the agency search to see w if there's a correspondence series that would match those numbers. And I think that line of research should work. But in general, these things will give you a potted history of the person, where they were and what their pay was. Not as simple as the railway cards, but still it's the same system. Now, the, for those of you who don't find a, a, a result looking in railway history cards and personal history cards, um, it's okay because there are other ways to do research and they do work. And one of the ways is to look in Government Gazette and Parliamentary Papers because we have copies in the reading room because from 1870 to 1939 they used to publish the list of railway employees every three years and so they would essentially do the same thing. They would publish their names, their positions, their locations and their pay. So if you think about it, if you came in or if you go to anywhere where you can access the government gazettes and, and parliamentary papers, and of course you can do that in Trove now as well, you can actually see every three years what they were doing and create your own personal history card. So if you don't get a result with the history cards, it is okay to go down this line. And one thing that I didn't mention with the, the weakness of the personal history cards is that that series was kept as a record of superannuation. So what I find when I'm working in the reading room and helping the public is that sometimes there's no card. And I always assume, you can always have a situation where something's gone missing, but without further in, uh, information, I always assume that's probably an indicator they didn't have, they weren't part of the superannuation system because that's why the cards were created. Now, if that happens to you in your research, you can switch to this line of inquiry between 1870 and 1839. And as I said, because Trove is now, Government Gazette is now on Trove, you can start there. This is just a little bit closer up view so you can remember it and see it is just as powerful as the personal history cards. There are other records. And each one will depend on if your person was in those branches and so forth. So if you want to take it a little bit further, the R series are only, you'll have to come into the reading room um, to look at the indexes, but also we, um, for each of these records, the records are here available in, at Kingswood at this time. And this is just an example of one of the R series, uh, uh, it's R319 in this case. It'll actually, in our reading room, we can show you item listings taken from the original railways and you will get a listing of how to find the records. In this case, if I'm looking for Mr. Biggs in the personal history cards of the communication branch, I know it's now in box one. And that is now 15 minutes away. I can see the card of that person if there's a result. Going back to the guides, you can also click on the stories on the right hand side. And this is something I think that will improve over time as we, we keep working on our processes. But you can see different examples of things that might interest you at the time. Now we'll go into photographs. Um, railways are very photographic. You have the, the, the technology of the locomotives. Uh, you have sometimes have people in the photographs. And we are doing 
everything we can to, to make those available online. And over time, that will get better and better and better. For the time being, they're both available in the reading room and also online. So I have to make you aware that it's not just online you can find photographs. If you're looking at a particular station, or if you're looking at a particular line of, of locomotive or, or, or situation, we, you can find more in the reading room. And if you're not sure if it's worth the visit in your case, feel free to ring because archivists work here, and including myself, I like your eyes and ears in the archive, and we can actually look through our finding aids and tell you if there's something that you might want to see. And um, so never feel a need to come just to have a look. You can always ring or you can write an email if, they, if it's a slightly complicated question and we can then do the investigation and see, give you a situation where you know what, you're, what you might be getting into. Now in this case, let's get into looking at some photographs. It's NRS 17420. Now this is an example of the listing that we have in the reading room. Just to let you know, there's more than what you'll find online. And what you see in this case is a series of stations and they've got numbers and those numbers translate to a box in our collection. So in the reading room, you can access photographs in those series. This is an, now we'll look at photographs. Some of them are available online. This happens to be um, strikers during the 1917 strike. Here's an example of a derailment. When I've been preparing talks over the years, I've, I've oftentimes found it interesting that if I can find a derailment photograph, I can then translate that into information on Trove about the derailment. So you can you can take a photograph and you can actually go to the story behind why did it go off the trails and what can I see in the photograph that reflects in the Trove article. So that's an example of how you, you take one item in a collection and then you can then expand upon it either in other collections or in other sources or other items in the same collection. That's, how, that's research at its most interesting. The next photograph, I wanted to show you some excellent show, shots of people and people doing things. This is 1942 at Everly Workshops. And some of our most iconic photographs. This is also Everly, a rolling out of a new locomotive, 1945. And I think the next shot, I'm curious what they're all looking at, but that's one of our iconic shots from Everly as well, 1945. They look happy too. And not to be left out completely, um, the mo locomotives are very ph photogenic um, technology and the collection has enormous photographs of different types of locomotives. Um, from quite a, a large percentage of the era of the of the locomotives of different types. And I thought I'd leave you with this one on the photograph line because we actually have a before and after. Because you weren't ready for that, I'm going back. There's the before. And there's the after in 1947. the Bathurst refreshment room. And the refreshment rooms do feature quite a lot in our photographs. So if you're interested in the, the culture of New South Wales history, there's a lot to be found in our archives. So we're now rounding down the webinar and we're moving into the railway listings. Um, for the time being, it's approximately 25% of the collection. I've been working here since uh, 2005 and, and it was probably the other way around. It was probably only a quarter of the collection was, was been described. So that shows you a, a very quick pace of work by archivists who are doing the transcriptions and the, the changes from one system to another for you and making them available online. So, but for the time being, and for a webinar presented today, I have to show you the railway listings because a quarter of the collection is available only from the reading room item listings. So that means I have to show you, and here we go. This is how it works. It's actually quite simple. It provides a listing of all the state rail archives not converted at the current time, and it's updated regularly. Now we're going to look at R216 as an example. It's really just a word, a, a, a folder in a, in a window system. So we go in and you can see two word documents. Now the first one is just a series description. This is how archivists think. This is the, this is the description of what it is, who created it and so forth. And so it's of not, uh, not great use to a person on the outside, but it does give you the context of what the record is. The second one is the more interesting one because it's an actual item listing. 
And if you click on that and go into it and then start browsing, you can see all sorts of things that may be of interest to you in your research, particularly if you're into the technology of the, of the, of the different sorts of um, locomotives and so forth, or any other sort of record that's in there, including all the R301s, the maps and plans. You can actually see a list. And by browsing down the list and then looking at the container number, you can just make a simple order of the record. Now, for those of you who are enjoying the process of being given a, sh a little bit of a window on, on how archives think, on the right-hand side, you can see Access Direction 3, and Access Direction 3 means that it gives us guides on whether the records are available or not. Now, I haven't looked at Access Direction 3 recently, but I believe that's open after 30 years, and so I think those records you can see on the screen are all available to the public. Now, we are winding down the webinar, and I, I think it's very important to mention the Australian His Railway Historical Society. Um, they regularly have people working here on the archives, and they're, they're doing an enormous amount of work to make the records available to the public. They've, been, they've created scans from a lot of different sorts of records, including some of the, the, the maps and plans and so forth, and career cards. So that resource is available to you as well. And um, certainly, if you're interested in railways, I would always go there, and you can buy magazines and so forth as to support your research. And also, I wanted to just give you a little bit of a, an indicator that we've got an exhibition currently underway, Marriage, Love and Law, and it is available at the Penrith Regional Gallery from 30th March to 15th of June this year. And it is a snapshot through the collection on marriage, and all the different sorts of changes over time on a, on a topic that did change as the laws of society changed and people change, the values of society changed. And so it is actually an interesting way of looking at what we have in the collection. Which brings me to the conclusion of the webinar today and one of my, my favourite photographs from our collection. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I, I deliberately avoided the temptation of trying to show you everything because I would have held you down for a few days. But what I did try and do is to give you a taste of everything, a little little dish from each of the different parts of the menu. And I hope in today's talk I've inspired some thought or I give you some angles on how to research. And always remember that you can come into the archive or you can also ring us and get advice over the phone and take today's topic a little bit deeper with conversations with archivists who know exactly what we have. And we can always look at finding aids for you and help you to find things that aren't at the moment available online. And 